I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, Lyndon Baines Johnson, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. I, William Jefferson Clinton. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. To preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. Leaders, protectors, history makers. There is one job at the top that guarantees your name in the history books. A job that pledges to defend the Constitution and guard the free world. Freedom, liberty, and justice. The cornerstones of democracy and the oath of the President of the United States. Throughout the storied history of this great nation, many presidents have left their mark from this high office, and the actions they take decide the fate of millions of Americans. The personalities and gestures of each become part of their impenetrable legacy. Join us as we take an in-depth look at the journey of some of the most influential people in the history of humankind. These are the Presidents. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Continue our economic strategy. We'll be weakened economically. In the tapestry of American politics, certain figures emerge, not just as leaders, but as architects of an era. If the president commits the crimes of perjury and obstruction of justice and witness tampering, deserving of punishment and accountability, one such personality whose presidency encapsulates the hopes and complexities of the 1990s is William Jefferson Clinton. Well, my fellow Americans, this is our time. Today, a generation raised in the shadows of the Cold War assumes new responsibilities in a world warmed by the sunshine of freedom. And she now says that within four months of starting that job, she was having an affair with the President of the United States. A man whose story unfolds as a compelling narrative of triumphs, controversies, and the intricacies of governance. Bill Clinton is a deeply flawed person who's made many mistakes in his personal life, but he is one of the most talented politicians uh, in U.S. history. I care very, I care just as much about those Muslims in the heart of Bosnia. It's clear to me that the um, Middle East peace process is in a state of crisis. But health's now an industry careering out of control. And it is time to fix it. From the humble town of Hope, Arkansas, to the halls of the Oval Office, Clinton's journey is a reflection of the American dream, woven with the challenges and opportunities that define an era. Join us as we embark on a chronological journey through the highs and lows of Bill Clinton's presidency, an expedition that not only shaped the nation, but left a mark on the political landscape. I never told anybody to lie. In fact, it was wrong. Thank you. Bill Clinton's journey began in the heart of the American South, in the small town of Hope, Arkansas. Born on August 19, 1946. Well, I think it was sort of a <clears throat> typical Arkansas childhood. I uh, 
live with my grandparents till I was four because my mother was widowed and was going back to school. And they had very uh, modest means, but I certainly never felt deprived in any way. His father, William Jefferson Blythe Jr., died in a car accident shortly before Clinton's birth. His mother, Virginia Cassidy Blythe, later married Roger Clinton Sr., who became Bill Clinton's stepfather. And Roger Clinton uh, was his stepfather, but he was also incredibly abusive. He was an alcoholic. Uh, and at different times in uh, Bill Clinton's life, he tried to, to confront him. And there was a lot of tension there in the home. And he tried to stand up for his mother. And then I grew up um, in a kind of a middle-class home with uh, a lot of friends, a good public school education. Education became a beacon for young Bill. Gifted with intelligence and an appetite for learning, Clinton's academic prowess became evident early on. In terms of his academic career, he was always a star. He did really well uh, in school, but it was at this time uh, that he really came into his own, really became interested in politics. He was interning, uh, a political intern at this period, and he really saw a life in politics for himself. Clinton's academic pursuits took him to Georgetown University, where he immersed himself in the world of politics and internal affairs. A Rhodes Scholarship later, Clinton found himself in the halls of Oxford University in England. Clinton's two years at Oxford as the Vietnam War raged shaped him and those around him as World War II had shaped George Bush. It was the first time I had in my life uh, when essentially I had free time just to learn for learning's sake when I wasn't on some sort of achievement track. Oxford not only broadened his intellectual horizons, but exposed him to a diversity of global perspectives. I was able to just uh, immerse myself in the life of the country. Uh, I traveled quite extensively both uh, in Br Britain and uh, throughout Europe, but uh, and I read a lot. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of books that I never would have read otherwise. And just, uh, it was a time of intensely private and personal uh, immersion for me <clears throat> in a country that I came to love with the people I came to respect very much. Um, it was one of the most important periods of my life and one of the most enjoyable. The return to the United States marked the next phase of Clinton's educational journey. Yale Law School became the crucible where his passion for public service and law converged. He would go off to Yale Law School starting in 1970, and it was here in the Yale Law School library that he would meet Hillary Clinton. And then he caught my eye and he began staring back at me. And so here I am in the library, not reading. Here he is actually surrounded by people who are talking at him, not talking back. So finally, I thought, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm in this class with this person. And so I put my books down and I went up and I said, you know, if you're going to keep looking at me and I'm going to keep looking at you, we ought to at least know each other's names. I'm Hillary Rodham. Who are you? And he says that he couldn't remember his name. That makes me feel so good when he says that. <laughs> Um, so he found her to be incredibly intelligent and confident and self-possessed, and he was immediately attracted to her energy. And he would propose to her, and the first time she would say no, but the second time she did say yes, and they would eventually marry in front of just 15 people. And from the beginning, they really were a team. Uh, they were both incredibly intelligent, they were best friends, and they were equally committed to, to their own careers. Bill and Hillary Clinton were married on October 11th, 1975, in a small ceremony in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Another Southern governor, Bill Clinton from Arkansas, a man who became a potential candidate with one good speech this week. In 1979, at the age of 32, Bill Clinton stepped into the governor's mansion, the youngest governor in Arkansas history. He won that election really handily, and he would become, at the age of 32, the youngest governor in U.S. history. His vision was clear, to uplift education, invigorate the economy, 
and bridge the gaps in a conservative state. And from that point on, he would win four consecutive terms as governor and was fairly popular. Governor Clinton made education a priority, advocating for higher teacher salaries and better schools. His policies sought to strike a delicate balance between progressive reforms and the values of a traditionally conservative state. He was tough on crime, which conservatives liked. Uh, he was in favor of the death penalty, which conservatives liked. Um, and he was in favor of welfare reform, which conservatives liked. But he was also supportive of affirmative action. He was supportive of just helping the most vulnerable communities, um, improving the livelihoods for those that didn't have these types of advantages. Clinton's leadership style, often termed New Democrat, sought to modernize the Democratic Party, blending traditional values with a more centrist approach. It was a bridge between ideology and practical governance. And a large reason for his popularity was he was able to govern as a centrist. He was able to combine the best of conservatism with the best of progressivism. To some people, Bill Clinton sounds like a Republican and part Democrat. What is he? Um, Bill Clinton is a problem solver. He's a pragmatist. He's somebody who wants to make life better for people and who understands that uh, what's happened in the last 10 years is that uh, middle income people in our country have had a lot of uh, uh, hard times and that he believes that we need to put aside these labels that interfere with focusing on what we need to uh, do and forge a consensus that brings Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, everybody together as Americans again and get on the business of reversing the decline that we have suffered in this country and recapturing uh, better opportunities for our children. The stage was set. Governor Clinton's achievements in Arkansas laid the foundation for a national journey. The road ahead had presidential aspirations. I believe that together we can make America great again. And with your help, your heart, your devotion, and your efforts, we can build a community of hope that will inspire the world. God bless you, and thank you very much. We need to provide more education and training and childcare and medical services, but then we must insist that when people can work, they must work. I want to end welfare as we know it and restore dignity and self-esteem to every American. We don't want a victory of party. We want a victory for the American people, the people like those who are in this audience. In the shaky political landscape of 1992, Bill Clinton embarked on a presidential campaign that would redefine the American political narrative. So the U.S. was in a little bit of a weird state. The economy had been strong, more or less, during the mid-'80s. Uh, but the U.S. entered a small, short recession. Well, the truth is, this country is in trouble. We're in a recession that came to New Hampshire, signed, sealed, and delivered by the policies of the Bush administration. No state in the union has been as economically devastated as Michigan. Here, they're looking for a savior. One of the famous campaign slogans for Bill Clinton was, it's the economy, stupid. Is that he was going to be able to govern in a way that would lead the U.S. economy uh, to success. Clinton's campaign resonated with voters on several fronts. I'm not better off now than I was four years ago. So it's the economy? Yeah. And if there are no jobs, create those jobs. Bill Clinton is, according to most of the state-by-state -state analysis, ahead where it matters. But the tightening of the national polls brings a new factor into the race, the possibility of a squeeze on Ross Perot. However, Clinton's path to the presidency was far from smooth. The foreclosure rate in this state is way too high, way above the national average. It's too high in a lot of places, and it is insane to let it go on. I had, I had no idea. That's the only time the governor's allowed to talk issues. The rest of this session is devoted to those allegations about his private life and to the latest attack, Let me remind you. whether or not he dodged the military draft for the Vietnam War 20-odd years ago. Early in the campaign, allegations regarding his avoidance of military service during the Vietnam War surfaced, stirring controversy. And this looked to be really problematic uh, because many Americans looked down on those that were dodging the draft. 
And you're a phony. He's ahead in the polls in New York, but his support is soft. I vote for the lesser of two evils, Clinton. There was a letter that looked really incriminating, where he was thanking uh, someone who had helped him avoid getting drafted. Everybody who has reviewed this has said that nothing was done wrong. The issue of Clinton's draft history became focal points for critics. And Mr. Clinton, I think your nose is getting a little too long. Jerry Braun has been Clinton's most aggressive critic, you know calling him the about? Prince of Sleaze. Braun appeals to the ABC voters, anyone but Clinton. How dare you call me the Prince of Sleaze? These controversies threatened to derail his candidacy, forcing Clinton to confront his past openly. And instead of denying that this took place, he allowed it to be read out loud on ABC News, the entire letter. Now, the importance of this was instead of the press being able to access excerpts that might make him look poorly, they were able to see that it was a man who was really troubled at the time by this decision, that really was finding this decision to be painful and difficult and didn't want to do so. The Clintons have thrown their own mud. Wife Hillary reviving an old and unsubstantiated story that President Bush has had an extramarital affair. That backfired. The Clintons apologized. The president, in relaxed mood, has no rival in New York. And every reason to look pleased at the discontent and doubt surrounding his main Democratic rival. Clinton's opponent in the 1992 presidential race was the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush. We forget that interest rates are at record lows. We forget that inflation is better, and we forget that ag income is up in the United States, and as long as I'm president, it's gonna stay up. Bush Sr. was getting hammered for promising, read my lips, no new taxes. And then he went on to raise taxes. People just didn't believe in him. South Dakota and the Democrats doing the cheering for the first time in over a generation, and George Bush, their Pinocchio. Remember that little boy in those fairy tales that that lied and lied and lied, and his nose grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Bush Sr. at one point had one of the highest approval ratings of all time after the U.S. invaded uh, Iraq the first time. But Bush was unable to capitalize on this goodwill that the public had towards him, and instead was getting punished for small gaffes here and there. Bill Clinton came to the car workers of suburban Detroit to win back the votes Ronald Reagan took 12 years ago and kept for George Bush. All the signs are this disaffected middle class is returning to the Democrats. We don't want a victory of party. We want a victory for the American people, the people like those who are in this audience. A seasoned politician and former vice president, Bush had led the nation through the end of the Cold War and the Gulf War. Despite his foreign policy successes, Bush faced challenges on the domestic front, particularly related to economic concerns and the perceived detachment from domestic issues. It's a measure of Clinton's success that for the next two days he'll campaign in the South, attacking George Bush in his home state and what was once his heartland, but is no more. You cannot gauge Republican support from stage managed ticket-only events like this at Sioux Falls. Like the other mountain states, this was stoutly Republican. But it seems that four years of George Bush has changed all that. Here, as right across the country, he's trying to swell support in these dwindling campaign days. Only seven to go now with his Good News America routine. So if you look at the campaign, uh, when it looked like Clinton's back is against the wall, and this is actually when he's at his best, when his back is against the wall, he was able to come through and... and uh, resonate with the public. He was able to make an appearance on the talk show, late night talk show host Arsenio Hall, playing the saxophone, humanizing him. And these are the types of things that, that the people were connecting to that George Bush Sr. was not able to do. Bill Clinton is, according to most of the state-by-state -state analysis, ahead where it matters. In the end, Bill Clinton's ability to connect with voters on domestic issues and his resilience in the face of controversies propelled him to victory. The next president of the United States, Governor Bill Clinton, you are a Clinton and Chelsea. And the next vice president of the United States, Senator Al Gore. Chipper. In, 
In some ways, it wasn't surprising that he was able to win the campaign, but in other ways, it was because he had been rocked by so many scandals, really from the beginning of his political campaign. One month after his presidency began, Bill Clinton set out to reform the U.S. health care system, aiming for universal coverage and improved access to medical services. This health care system of ours is badly broken, and it is time to fix it. His proposal, known as the Clinton Health Care Plan, or the Health Security Act, sought to ensure that all Americans had access to affordable health insurance. So the idea behind it was that Americans could choose between different private insurance plans and the insurance market would be regulated better so that this would keep costs low. First Lady Hillary Clinton played a pivotal role in leading the campaign for health care reform. Hillary Clinton, his wife, of course, was attached to this big bill that they were going to reform health care to, to ensure that every American was insured and to regulate the private insurance companies. No country in the world spends as much of its earnings on health as this. Yet no industrial power has as many people, almost 40 million, who go without basic care because they can't afford it. This traditionally has been the American way, the ultimate free market, the survival of the strongest. What do you do if you get sick? Pray a lot. You don't do anything. You can't go to the doctors. You can't afford it. You might die and people will be just watching you. So it's a big worry because you need to be secure about your health. His administration also aimed to address the AIDS crisis through increased funding for research, prevention, and treatment. Today, viruses are a subject we hear about more and more. We all know the word virus for most of us. The only time knowing about viruses becomes important is when we're ill. To staying at the fight against HIV and AIDS until it is a problem of the past. The administration also sought to reduce discrimination against individuals with HIV AIDS. Despite initial momentum, Clinton's health care reform plan faced significant challenges and ultimately failed to gain congressional approval. Though there was a lot of political interest in, in the reform package, though there was a, a lot of public support in the beginning, they ran into resistance from the American Medical Association and from the insurance companies. The plan encountered strong opposition from various interest groups, including health insurance companies, conservative organizations, and some segments of the medical industry. So what happens to your little boy? You give him medicine over the counter. That's all you can do. And unfortunately, they didn't have the political will to really go against them, to really um, address it head on. And it ended up failing in Congress. And that was probably the biggest single domestic policy failure of Bill Clinton's career. However, in light to the aid epidemic, his administration implemented policies to expand access to drugs and increase funding for research. For example, the United States has now gone from spending about 25% of the world's expenditures fighting HIV and AIDS to about 30 to 33%. The following year, in August 1994, one of Bill Clinton's biggest scandals and most memorable moments for the president was unfolding, the Whitewater scandal. Whitewater was this company that was created along with uh, Bill Clinton's friends, Jim and Susan McDougall. It was a company to basically invest in land and create vacation homes, uh, but it was a failure. The Clintons got a half share of this land, even though they didn't invest anything like half the money. When the scheme collapsed, they didn't tell the tax man about much of their loss. Curious, because the Clintons are known for claiming just about everything against tax. The scandal also involved the failure of the Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan Association, a savings and loan institution owned by James McDougall. And even worse, Jim McDougall was uh, implicated in fraud. In fact, he'd engaged in fraudulent activities to the tune of $3 million. 
And so there were questions about whether or not Bill and Hillary Clinton were also involved in this fraudulent activity. And an investigation started. If the Clintons have nothing to hide, that is not the impression they're giving. The Whitewater Rapids begin gently. They may have the power to carry a man away, even a president. If, the, if I did something wrong, it will come out in the special counsel. They will find the truth. Let them do it. Attorney General Janet Reno appointed Robert Fisk as the independent counsel to investigate Whitewater. Kenneth Starr later succeeded Fisk in leading the investigation. There will not be a cover-up. There will not be an abuse of power in this office. This, and there is no credible charge that I violated any law, even way back in the dark ages of <laughs> years ago when this happened. The Clintons, however, were not charged with any criminal wrongdoing related to Whitewater. However, it was these investigations that would later uncover Bill Clinton's biggest controversy, arguably birthing the most famous chapter of his presidency. But for now, the president was focused on more pressing matters. The music was loud and we was laughing and joking around. It's three shots fired. He was killed. It really hurt. Why did this have to happen? Unfortunately, Alicia's story is all too common. Children with their childhood taken from them. Fear of violence is robbing our children of their future. We must take away that fear and give them hope. We must give Alicia and all our children back their childhood. Working together, we can. On September 13, 1994, Bill Clinton signed into law the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. This was a comprehensive piece of legislation that aimed to address rising crime rates and enhance law enforcement capabilities in the United States. I've been watching these kinds of issues all my life, and it's like civil rights or something, you know, where there's this huge organized resistance but if they just keep at it, they're gonna win. The act was one of the most substantial and far-reaching crime bills in U.S. history, encompassing a wide range of provisions, including mandatory minimum sentencing, a ban on assault weapons, and the expansion of the death penalty. One of the successes of his administration was the passing of the Brady Bill, which somehow managed to get through Congress, and we know with gun control in the U.S., this is very difficult to get anything through Congress because of the power of the NRA, the National Rifle Association, which is one of the most powerful lobbies in the U.S. But this was implemented to ensure that there was a five-day waiting period before you could access a handgun. The bomb which caused such devastation is now known to have weighed several thousand pounds. There have been times when the rescuers have had to stop their urgent work for hours at a time, while the section of the building they were due to search was shored up. On April 19, 1995, a truck bomb exploded outside a federal building in Oklahoma City. And the nature of what they've been finding will make identification a long, distressing process. This act of domestic terrorism resulted in significant loss of life and extensive damage to the surrounding area. One of the things that that uh, is hard to do is there are body parts coming out of that building that uh, when they get to the morgue, if they're not able to tag them to uh, a body that's already in there, uh, they may conclude that's another victim until later on, if they're able to make that identification, then they're able to uh, put that back together. But uh, uh, right now, the confirmed number is still 57, and, uh, and we're still doing the search. President Bill Clinton was swift in his response to the Oklahoma City bombing addressing the nation and expressing profound grief and solidarity with the victims and their families. The bombing in Oklahoma City was an attack on innocent children and defenseless citizens. It was an act of cowardice and it was evil. Clinton dispatched federal resources, including the FBI and FEMA, to Oklahoma City to aid in rescue and recovery efforts. He also visited the site to personally assess the situation and meet with survivors. Working with the Department of Justice, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, military and local authorities, we are sending the world's finest investigators to solve these murders. The Oklahoma City bombing influenced the political climate leading to a renewed focus on domestic terrorism. 
In the aftermath, President Clinton advocated for and signed into law the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996. During Clinton's time in presidency, there was major conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. It's clear to me that the um, Middle East peace process is in a state of crisis. In 1993, the Oslo Accords agreed a mutual recognition of the need for a peaceful resolution to the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You have sent, I say again, a powerful message, not to the government, but to the people of Israel. Both parties sought an end to hostilities and to establishment of a framework for coexistence. Mr. Clinton is trying to stop the peace process that was born amid such hope from crumbling altogether. You had the Prime Minister of Israel, Isaac Rabin, shaking hands with the president of the PLO, uh, Yasser Arafat. And that in itself was an achievement and there was hope that this would be the end of hostilities. The Accords marked the first time that Israel officially recognized the Palestine Liberation Organization as the representative of the Palestinian people. The PLO, in turn, recognized the state of Israel. Second ceremony at the White House, handing back more of the West Bank to Palestinian control. The agreements outlined a process for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from certain areas in the West Bank and Gaza. Earlier, there was a moment that was historic and even touching. The old Palestinian leader thanking the US president for his journey to Gaza. It came during the bold centerpiece of the president's visit. This was an initial achievement for the president. However, the Accords faced significant challenges. It was controversial with the Arab world. Um, they didn't feel that this agreement met their needs and in fact, uh, fighting in, between Israel and uh, the Palestinian territories uh, ignited afterwards. It has been an extraordinary day for the Palestinians of Gaza City, but it is still not clear if the peace process has really advanced. Tonight, the Israeli government is still listing the problems, while Netanyahu, Arafat and Clinton prepare for their meeting tomorrow. Tragically, the peace process faced setbacks, including the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1995 by a Jewish extremist opposed to the Oslo Accords. Yitzhak Rabin was my partner and my friend. I admired him and I loved him very much. Because words cannot express my true feelings, let me just say, Shalom, Javier. Goodbye, friend. The assassination had a profound impact on the trajectory of the peace process, ultimately proving unsuccessful. Not enough sacrifices were made from the Arabs' perspective um, on the Israeli side, and, and fighting erupted afterwards. It's now up to all of us to turn peace into a lasting settlement and the countries of former Yugoslavia into a stable and prosperous part of the European family. Like their British and French counterparts, they have been left to clear millions of mines strewn first across the battlefields of the Gulf, then the hills of Bosnia. Bill Clinton embarked on further foreign policy issues to help bring peace to the Bosnian war. Under mounting pressure to do something about Bosnia, but lacking a plan of his own, President Clinton today poured cold water on the only plan around. Uh, it's not a criticism so much as a reluctance on the part of the United States to impose on parties an, an agreement which they do not freely accept themselves, particularly one that might work to the immediate and to the long-term further disadvantage of the Bosnian Muslims. The conflict involved various ethnic groups, primarily Bosnians, Croats, and Serbs, and resulted in widespread violence, ethnic cleansing, and displacement of populations. Maps are very sensitive. We can't uh, say we are giving uh, land. Mr. Karadic then went straight upstairs to ask the peace negotiators for more land 
President Bill Clinton played a crucial role in navigating the complex diplomatic landscape and encouraging the peace process and the Dayton Accords. Our children deserve to walk the earth in safety. I care very, I care just as much about those Muslims in the heart of Bosnia as I do about any other group of people in the world. I would give anything to, 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 to somehow bring an end to the ethnic cleansing. The implementation of the peace agreement brought an immediate halt to the hostilities and paved the way for a more stable environment. It involved uh, many U.S. troops that were working with NATO uh, to stabilize the region, uh, and it was heralded as a success. It was American diplomats who finally brokered the peace deal, and it was to President Clinton that the chief credit went today. He'd come to Paris to see a deal made in Dayton, Ohio, formally signed in President Chirac's Elysee Palace. The Dayton Accords established a framework for peace. I've seen what war has wrought. You know what peace can bring. Seize this chance and make it work. Do not let your children down. But challenges remained in terms of post-war recovery, reconciliation, and political stability in the region. Bill Clinton's foreign policy was not as successful as his domestic policy. There were a lot more missteps than domestically. He was less prepared on the world stage, though he was respected. The things that come to mind are the failure in Somalia, uh, the failure in Rwanda to stop a genocide from taking place, where you, you had um, little to no action. I mean, the UN was also culpable, um, but the US was unable uh, to really stop some of the devastation that had taken place. Bill Clinton's reelection took place in 1996, and it was a significant chapter in his political career. My fellow Americans, after these four good, hard years, I still believe in a place called hope, a place called America. Clinton's Thank campaign you. heavily focused on the strong performance of the U.S. economy during his first term and the successful implementation of the Dayton Accords, which ended the Bosnian War, adding to Clinton's foreign policy credentials. The United States experienced continued economic prosperity during Clinton's second term. Unemployment remained low, and the federal budget saw surpluses, a significant turnaround from previous deficits. However, Bill's legacy was about to be tarnished forever. But in retrospect, the real threat to the Clinton presidency began on a quiet summer's day in 1995. It was then that a 21-year-old woman started an unpaid job here at the White House. Her name, Monica Lewinsky, and she now says that within four months of starting that job, she was having an affair with the President of the United States. And I worked on it till pretty late last night. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. <laughs> The affair reportedly took place between 1995 and 1997. Linda Tripp, a co-worker of Lewinsky's, secretly recorded conversations in which Lewinsky detailed her relationship with Clinton. Tripp later shared this information with Special Prosecutor Ken Starr. 17 tapes have now been handed over to the Special Prosecutor. Ken Starr was able to uncover a piece of information that he felt uh, qualified as reason to impeach Bill Clinton. And that was that he had been having an affair with an intern, a 22-year-old Monica Lewinsky. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. They are the tapes that almost brought down a president, the secret recordings that made Monica Lewinsky one of the most famous women on earth. The president initially denied the scandal for legal and political reasons. Monica Lewinsky faced intense public scrutiny 
to limit the time it will take to talk to Ms. Lewinsky and two others. I did not. Sex in the Oval Office, for example, is not to be discussed. She became a central figure in the scandal, with her personal life becoming the subject of widespread discussion. So the Lewinsky scandal was a huge embarrassment to Hillary Clinton. She just found it a huge breach of trust, and it was a public humiliation. I want to say Hillary and I have been over there just laughing this up. We don't want this to ever end. She initially defended him and later described the affair as a vast right-wing conspiracy. However, the scandal put a strain on the Clinton marriage. The stage is now set for a televised trial Mr. in the Senate. President commits the crimes of perjury, and obstruction of justice, deserving for national security. punishment. And As evidence grew and tapes were released, this is personal. Bill admitted to the scandal. And that is why I'm speaking to you tonight. As you know, in a deposition in January, I was asked questions about my relationship with Monica Lewinsky. While my answers were legally accurate, I did not volunteer information. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. The Bill Clinton experienced the worst 24 hours of his political life. In fact, it was wrong. What will the French think? What will the British think? It constituted a critical lapse in judgment. These allegations are false, for which I am solely and completely responsible. Uh, it referenced the uh, the cover story that uh, that you and he had had. That perhaps you could say that you were coming to my office to deliver papers or to see Betty Curry. Is that right? Correct. That that was from the entire relationship. That story. Now, Bill Clinton's impeachment was an historic event that unfolded in the late 1990s, marking only the second time in U.S. history that a sitting president faced impeachment proceedings. The current estimate is that only about five Republicans in the House of Representatives are prepared to vote against impeachment. About the same number of Democrats will vote for it. So if those numbers don't change, Bill Clinton will become the first president in 130 years to be impeached, and the drama will move on to a trial in the Senate. In December 1998, the House of Representatives, led by Republicans, approved two articles of impeachment against Clinton, perjury and obstruction of justice. The stage is now set for a televised trial in the Senate with Monica Lewinsky giving evidence. If convicted, the president will be removed from office. That is unlikely, but after today, the White House is taking nothing for granted. Impeach the man, this is not only a disgrace to our country, but they fear for our national security. All the people in my district think that the president ought to stay in office. They don't like the uh, Ken Starr witch hunt against him, and they uh, really think he's doing a good job as president, and they support him. Outside Congress, many hailed the impeachment. Bill Clinton's place in history now secure, charged with high crime after a year of high drama. Deserving of punishment and accountability, but not the nuclear weapon of throwing him out of office. He clearly has confessed to God, and we must assume that God has forgiven him. Why can't we forgive him? If the president commits the crimes of perjury and obstruction of justice and witness tampering, he should not be allowed to remain in office. The salacious allegations in this referral are simply intended to humiliate, embarrass, and politically damage the president. In short, this is personal and not impeachable. And then, by the way, David Kendall is not the one who's going to determine what's impeachable and what isn't. It's the House of Representatives. And they can use almost any standard they want to to determine what is or is not impeachable. Just a mile from there, thousands are gathered to protest, not against the military involvement in Iraq, but against the imminent impeachment of the military's commander-in-chief. To the disgust of the Democrats, the impeachment debate will start tomorrow while U.S. forces are still in action. What will the Russians think? What will the Chinese think? What will the French think? What will the British think? What will anybody think? This is wrong and it should not be happening. He obviously tomorrow. has been uh, deeply humiliated and embarrassed uh, in a personal sense uh, with his family and friends and uh, before the nation and the world. Uh, I don't think it can be called a victory of any sort. Uh, I do think the American people wisely and rightly recognize from the outset 
that this was a case that should not have been brought. On February 12, 1999, Clinton was acquitted on both charges, with the perjury charge failing by a vote of 55 to 45, and the obstruction of justice charge by 50 to 50. But it did not pass in the Senate. And in fact, it actually backfired for the Republicans. Uh, in a curious way, the Republicans in Congress uh, need it even more than he does. Their standing is at an all-time low. Uh, they have, are in great danger of becoming seen uh, solely as the party of impeachment. The only problem is and independent counsel Ken Starr, also having off the weekend, must have wondered why, with his report now public, the president's approval rating has climbed even higher. His approval rating after the impeachment hearings took place was at 70%. And it, it really didn't go well for the Republicans because they thought that I think the entire public would galvanize against him when instead they actually felt that this was an unnecessary use of taxpayer dollars. Clinton remained in office for the rest of his term. The impeachment did not result in his removal from the presidency. He now has less than half his second term to run. Uh, is that time enough, do you think, now to do something significant domestically, perhaps even in foreign policy too? Well, I think that in a curious way, uh, there's a coming together of political incentives to get something meaningful done. The president obviously wants to do so uh, to use the remainder of his term for productive purposes and to shift the focus of history off of this unfortunate incident. American citizens felt that, you know, the economy was doing well. Um, in fact, there was some of the lowest unemployment levels that the U.S. has ever seen. The median income had, had risen. You had more U.S. homeowners than ever before. Inflation was in check. The economy appeared to be booming. And many people attributed Bill Clinton and his policies uh, to this economic boom. And they felt that this distraction of impeaching him over something that many people might have found morally reprehensible but not something that merited impeaching him. The impeachment left a lasting impact on both Clinton's legacy and the political landscape. While Clinton's presidency is often remembered for economic prosperity, the scandal cast a shadow over his personal conduct. Yeah, take a look at that. That was my ghetto gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah, it's horrible. laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Yo, what up, dog? I heard you got some beef with me. You know? Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher at Columbus High School. There is a student here with a gun. Oh my god, that was really close. That just rattled me. Okay. I'm really What's your name, ma'am? Patty? When after everything happened, you say to yourself, do I ever want to teach again? That crosses your mind. Do I ever want to go back? But you go back and you're so blessed. The Columbine High School massacre occurred on April 20th, 1999, when two students, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, opened fire at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. The tragedy resulted in the deaths of 12 students and one teacher, with many others injured. I thought for sure that I was going to be next, so I curled up really, really tight, put my arms above me like this, and just kind of held my breath, braced myself to get, get shot in the ribs. I want to begin by saying that... And then there was nothing. Hillary and I are profoundly shocked and saddened by the tragedy today in Littleton where two students opened fire on their classmates. 
before apparently turning their guns on themselves. I've asked the Attorney General and the Secretary of Education to stand ready to assist local law enforcement, the schools, the families, the entire community during this time of crisis and sorrow. Bottom line is, you know, there's a thing out there that, you know, guns don't kill people, people kill people. If anyone could ever stand and say it would never happen here, this is the community that would say that. We are living proof that it can happen to anyone. In the aftermath of the tragedy, President Clinton renewed his calls for stricter gun control measures. He urged Congress to pass legislation to address the issue of gun violence, particularly targeting the easy accessibility of firearms. I just started getting angry because it's like, nothing has changed at all. I mean, after Newtown especially, you would have thought that somebody would have come up with some more gun laws or added or required a mental health workup before you're allowed to buy a gun, but nothing of that sort happened. So I've just been angry and, and pissed off. Soon after the Columbine tragedy, Congress considered common sense gun legislation to require Brady background checks at the gun shows, child safety locks for new handguns, and a ban on the importation of large capacity ammunition clips. With courage and a tie-breaking vote for the vice president, the Senate faced down the gun lobby, stood up to the American people, and passed this legislation. The Columbine massacre had a lasting impact on public discourse about gun control, school safety, and youth violence. President Clinton continued to advocate for gun control measures throughout the remainder of his presidency and after. Bill Clinton left office on January 20, 2001, marking the end of his second term as the 42nd president of the United States. Bill Clinton uh, left a strong economic legacy. The U.S. had pretty decent growth rates, incredibly low unemployment rates, fairly low inflation. Uh, he managed to um, balance the budget and bring us actually into uh, over $100 you know, billion dollar surplus. Uh, he helped bring up the median income. More Americans were homeowners than ever before. And there was a general sense that the economy was moving in the right direction. On January 20th, 2001, the inauguration ceremony for George W. Bush took place on the steps of the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. This event officially singled the transfer of presidential power. I am honored and humbled to stand here where so many of America's leaders have come before me, and so many will follow. I thank President Clinton for his service to our nation. Clinton's departure from the presidency marked the end of an era. Despite the controversies surrounding his departure, he left a lasting impact on U.S. politics and continued to be an influential figure globally. We have to keep getting the structural deficit down, but right now, with interest rates lower than inflation, this is the best time we'll ever have to undertake a massive Bill Clinton continued to play a role in public affairs and maintained relationships with subsequent presidents. Following their departure from the White House, Hillary Clinton went on to pursue her own political career. Around the world as well as here at home. She was elected as the U.S. Senator from New York in 2000, setting the stage for her future role as Secretary of State and a presidential candidate. The story of Bill Clinton's life and presidency is one of remarkable highs and challenging lows, a narrative that reflects the complexities inherent in political leadership. From his humble beginnings in Hope, Arkansas, to the halls of power in Washington, 
Clinton's journey has been marked by personal resilience and political intelligence. As we reflect on the highs and lows of Bill Clinton's life and presidency, it becomes clear that the narrative is as nuanced as the man himself. A story of ambition, resilience, and the personal battle between flaws and achievements. A tale that continues to be debated and analyzed, shaping the broader understanding of leadership, power, and the human side of politics.